This is a quote from uh, The Guardian, which is a great newspaper that I get sometimes online. Aesthetics today, atheists today, are too often castigated as materialistic calculators whose lack of spirituality sucks their universe empty of all beauty. Remembering Percy Bly's, Shelley's arguments for the non-existence of God and a short the necessity of atheism gives us an opportunity to counter this stereotype and to reflect on the ascetic enchantment with which a non-theistic worldview can be associated. The works of Shelley join the novels, poems, songs, sculptures, paintings, architecture, and plays of generations of godless artists in exposing the straw man of the desiccated rationalist for what it is and showcasing a humanistic vision of life. That's from Andrew Copson um, in 2011, Atheism's Aesthetics of Enchantment. So I've been, a, as Marian mentioned, <laughs> she found that out, an atheist since the age of 15. I've never actually spoken publicly about it before, so this is a first. I was <laughs> strongly uh, convinced then and am still today uh, by a number of arguments against God's existence. Uh, first, there's the problem of evil, which has never been adequately answered by theologians. How could a good God create a world with so much suffering? The atheist answer is that the existence of so much suffering proves that there is no God, if God is defined as the all-good, all-powerful creator of the universe. Second, there is a scientific evidence for a materialistic universe. I'm so happy that it's Darwin's birthday here today. And there is no need for immaterial things like God to explain what is yet been explained, not yet been explained by science. Evolutionary theory, for example, gives us a much better explanation of the emergence of human consciousness than any religion. And third, the traditional proofs for the existence of God all fail for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into here. Um, now fourth, religion is just not necessary for morality. Uh, I will not go into the arguments for atheism here, but if you are interested, there are a number of good books on that available. In short, I find it hard to understand how belief in God, immaterial souls, and the afterlife can be taken any more seriously than belief in fairies, to tell you the truth. But I'm not against religion. Um, I think religion has a lot to offer us, even those of us who are non-believers. I admire religion for trying to deal with the fundamental issues of what it is to be human, uh, for addressing our deepest hopes, fears, and needs. Religion at its best is based on experiences, for example, the felt presence of God in the world or in the hearts of those who believe in Him, which have for large numbers of people given meaning to human existence. Philosophy of the non-religious sort, however, handles these issues better because it's not burdened by the metaphysical baggage associated with traditional religious belief. Philosophy questions authority and allows us to doubt. But I do not reject religion because I believe in doubt. To be sure, doubt is something I value, although for many, doubt can be a source of pain. I enjoy it, uh, at least when it's directed to the big questions. I not only enjoy the adventure of raising difficult questions of the sort philosophers raise and trying to answer them, I enjoy the to and fro of debate over these things. However, philosophy does not just give me doubt. I love philosophy partly because it gives me a suitable replacement for faith. That's not to say that my belief in philosophy is an example of faith. I do not have faith in philosophy. Faith is belief based on some scripture or on the say-so of some religious leader. And philosophy does not offer anything like that, or at least it shouldn't. In logic, the appeal to authority fallacy uh, happens whenever an authority is deemed to be higher than reason or evidence. Uh, for example, you say that something's true because the Pope says it's true. Uh, now, uh, what philosophy gives me um, uh, more than the joy of debate 
is that I find there several quite different, beautiful, and systematic ways of understanding the world, each offered by a single writer or by a school of thought, ways that address some of the same fundamental issues addressed by religion. Of course, it's up to each student of philosophy to not only understand and appreciate these systems, but also to oppose them uh, and borrow from them in constructing one's own system. But before I go into that, uh, I will say a couple words about science. Science is a wonderful thing, and I am a great advocate of science, uh, and most philosophers I know feel the same way. Uh, I'm not convinced that science is the only path to truth, but I think it is a very important one. Uh, I and most philosophers are happy with sharing inquiry with science. Philosophers typically ask and try to answer questions that science cannot answer. Traditionally, whenever a question becomes resolved or even resolvable by science, we just happily give it to science. You can do that now. For example, philosophers no longer are concerned with the ultimate building blocks of the material universe. We think science and scientists are doing the best job that can be done with this problem. So what do philosophers do? They ask and try to answer a certain kind of question. Most philosophical questions take the form, what is X? For example, what is truth? What is reality? Man, law, beauty, art. They even offer competing, uh, they then offer competing definitions of theories of these things and argue about them. There are also the does X exist questions, such as does God exist? We also ask the closely related question, what does the word X mean? For example, uh, you may need to ask what is meant by the word God before you can ask whether God exists. Of course, not all what is X questions are in the domain of philosophy. Again, uh, there are what is X questions that are best answerable by science. For example, what is water? I'm not saying that uh, this question has been finally answered by scientists, but they're on the way and they are getting better and better at it every day. However, there are other what is X questions such as what is moral goodness, which are not answerable yet by science. Religion provides answers to some such questions, but again, religion does so via the appeal to authority fallacy, and its answers are metaphysically suspect. This is one of the few groups that I can say these things to, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, question, it is questions like these, or at least the important ones, that are the domain of philosophy. Philosophy then sits in many ways between religion and science. It is sympathetic to aspects of each, but it follows its own path and its own methods. It also turns out that, um, and this is equally important for me today, that art, especially great art, including music, visual art, literature, dance, architecture, movies, and so forth, also provides much of what religion gives us or gave us in the past, but usually without religious belief. Although most people today still seem to need religion, great philosophy and great art can together give us all we thought we could only get from religion. Nevertheless, as I will argue, uh, that does not mean that religion is without value, even for atheists. But someone asks, what about morality? Oddly, I suppose, I don't consider morality a complicated problem, uh, unlike many of my colleagues. Thousands of years ago, Confucius and later Jesus got it right. The basic moral rule is that you ought to treat others as you would have them treat you. This isn't true because either of these people said it was true. They just provided the formulation of a basic insight. The basic moral truth was recognized much later by Immanuel Kant as the second formulation of the categorical imperative. And as he puts it, act in such a way to treat people primarily as ends and not primarily as means. Without this moral rule, we would not be able to function as a society. The more people follow it, the better off we will be. There are also moral saints who go beyond following this basic rule and helping others. I would say that their acts are not only morally right, but morally beautiful. Since beauty is an aesthetic comment, we are entering here into the domain of aesthetics. 
The civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s is an example of something that was not just morally right, but morally beautiful. Uh, we can argue over this, but I do not think much more needs to be said about eth ethics, at least by me today. Um, you may ask me why I am not an agnostic, especially given my natural skepticism. Agnostics, it is true, reject all dogmatic belief. But an agnostic holds that religious, regarding religious belief, there can be no knowledge one way or another. On the issue of God, the agnostic just says, I do not know, I cannot know. But how does the agnostic know that he cannot know uh, about God's existence or his non-existence? Most agnostics claim to know a large number of things in other aspects of their lives. So what makes the subject of God so unique? Um, some people say that you cannot prove that God does not exist, and yet atheists have come up with perfectly good proofs for that, proofs that just are not accepted by either believers or agnostics. From the atheist perspective, uh, evidence for belief in God is pretty much on the same level as evidence for other spiritual beings, uh, such as I mentioned previously, fairies. Um, can we uh, ever be absolutely certain of anything? No. Can we be reasonably certain that God does not exist? Yes. But earlier I say, I was saying that philosophy offers me something more than just non-belief, and I want now to pursue that. Each philosopher has his or her own perspective, his or her own philosophy. Being a philosopher is a matter of building up, usually over a long time, an elaborate structure of ideas that helps make sense of things. We philosophers generally call this structure our philosophical position. Today I will be talking about my own position, or perhaps more modestly, my own hypothesis. And you shouldn't assume that I will be speaking for any other philosopher or school of thought on that. Now my point of view is based not only on years of reading and writing about philosophy, but also, like many other thinkers, on key moments of inspiration that have happened in my life. Few philosophers will admit this, but I would argue, perhaps controversially, that inspiration plays an important role in philosophy as it does in religion, art, science, and even in business and love. The idea of inspiration was originally tied to religion, the thought being that the prophet or mystic is inspired by God. However, philosophers, unlike saints, do not take moments of inspiration as guarantees of truth, only as relatively reliable guides towards inquiry. These moments, to be frank, can be like mystical experiences. Does this pose a problem? Does any use of inspiration give the game away to religion? Does it imply the existence of a world beyond our material world? I don't think so. I think that this material world in which we all exist has some pretty amazing properties. One of these being that it generates life, another that it produces consciousness, and another that it brings forth creative thinking and dramatic insight. One of the main reasons people become immaterialists or believers is that they shortchange what the material world and the material things in it, including us, can do. We do not yet know how this world accomplishes these things or how we as part of it do so, but this is no reason to hypothesize another world. So when it comes to having insights, I just think it is amazing that there are moments, usually after long study and hard intellectual work, when everything seems to come together and ideas flow, when we have a real idea, a real insight into things. Again, belief in the value of these experiences does not require belief in something non-material that causes them. Moments of insight just are one of the many surprising things that material world coughs up. Um, moreover, such moments are not limited to philosophy, as I just said. So part of the basis of what I will say is certainly a kind of experience, uh, an experience of inspiration, which is also hopefully, or at least seems to me to be, insightful. Whether or not it actually is depends on how its results fare in the battleground of ideas, and I'm happy with that. Again, I do not think that these experiences give what I will have to say any special validity, I do not think that they are much like mystic, I do think they're much like mystic experiences described by religious figures, although I have no way of proving that.
Experiences I'm describing often involve a perception of unity underlying a great deal of diversity. After a number of years of teaching philosophy, I find such a unity between a wide range of thinkers. And yet this unity ultimately depends, I must confess, on some rather unorthodox interpretations on my part. I doubt that I would ever be able to make this clear even to myself, and yet I do think that there is something like a perennial philosophy. That is, some inner truth to philosophy itself, a truth that is unfortunately hidden by superficial differences in language and approach. The claim, in short, if I were ever able to spell it out, would be that philosophers like Lao Tzu, Confucius, Plato, Kant, Thoreau, Emerson, Dewey, Nietzsche, Hegel, Heidegger, Dogon, all have a message to convey which is fundamentally the same despite all the differences between their various theories and ways of talking about them. The central idea is that there is a path of transcendence, but one that is without God. Without belief in an imminent or transcendent, immaterial or transcendent realm, and without souls that survive our deaths. All of these rejected ideas are just myths that hide and underline a much more important truth. So then, what does this have to do with speaking to a group of humanists? Well, just about everything, I think. Uh, humanism, I believe, is also fundamentally committed to this way of seeing things, or at least something like it, i.e. that there is no religious truth, and that there is something like a religion of humanity, or perhaps of life, and that this religion, if we can call something a religion that is without faith or God, has something to do with what Lao Tzu meant by the way, what Confucius meant by humanness, what Plato meant by the good, what Kant meant by transcendental unity of apperception, he uses big words, uh, what Hegel meant by the absolute, what Emerson and Thoreau meant by nature, what Nietzsche meant by eternity, and the Dionysian, what John Dewey, the great American pragmatist, meant by pervasive quality, and, and experience, what Heidegger meant by being, and what Zen means by Satori. Moreover, I think that the great religions were trying to talk about these things. They just got this all confused with wishful thinking about the goodness of the universe and the existence of an afterlife. So why all this talk about inspiration and mysticism? The perspective I take towards these issues is fundamentally aesthetic. That is, it focuses on aesthetic experience. There are all sorts of low-level aesthetic experiences. For example, the pleasure we take in a pretty dress or a lovely afternoon. But there is also what John Dewey referred to as an experience or an integral experience, which is a high point of experience and which is also aesthetic. That is, experience itself is graded according to its aesthetic of value uh, on the Deweyan principle. An experience, or what Dewey also called integral experience, has unity, a pervasive quality, great intensity, and considerable complexity. In general, Dewey argued, we should have more of such things in our lives and less inchoate experiences, less confusing experience, uh, which is really the opposite. Aesthetic experience should be uh, uh, not confused with artistic experience. Art plays an important role in aesthetics, but aesthetics includes natural aesthetics and everyday aesthetics, uh, as well as art aesthetics. Aesthetics deals not simply with a certain kind of experience, but with the properties that give rise to it. Notable among these are the beautiful and the sublime. Religious experience really is just experience of these properties, as is also uh, any profound experience of nature or of art. If you experience God, that is a sublime experience in the sense that it has aesthetic intensity and gives great delight as well as being pretty scary. Edmund Burke said that both terror and delight are essential to the sublime. A better example of the sublime for atheists is seeing something dramatic in nature like a volcano, but from a safe distance. So that there is an element of fear, but a greater element of enjoyable astonishment. 
Now when I say religion is just experience of these properties, that may seem unfair. The believer would say that the experience of God is sublime precisely because God really exists. Since I deny that he does, but want to be a bit fairer to the believer, uh, I will say that the most profound forms of religious experience are actually profound forms of aesthetic experience. Religion and art then are closely tied. Religion may be said to come into being with ritual and mythology. And ritual and mythology are proto-art forms. Ritual, of course, requires belief in God or gods. And the earliest drama and dance uh, and other art forms were ritualistic. But as religious elements gradually disappeared from art performance and as enjoyment of art no longer required belief in spiritual entities, secular art arose. Uh, but it's still tied uh, to its origins in, I believe, pretty profound ways. I have a name for my approach to religion, a pretty clunky one, uh, as these things go. I call it aesthetic atheism. The combination may seem strange. Aesthetic atheism is a kind of atheism, uh, as you've seen, is predicated on non-belief. However, at the same time, it stresses the aesthetic, particularly the beautiful and the sublime. I developed the idea of a dissatisfaction with more mechanistic and I believe ham-fisted approaches to atheism like those of such recently famous atheist thinkers as Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett. Aesthetic atheism is somewhat more positive about religion than other forms of atheism. As I have suggested, religion is predicated on religious experience and religious experience is very close in character to the powerful and profound experiences we have of art nature and philosophy. Aesthetic atheism recognizes this. As I said earlier, aesthetic atheism learns from the great philosopher, with the important exception, by the way, of Descartes, who made no worthwhile contribution to this project, whose logicism over reliance on mathematics, mechanistic view of nature, hardcore dualism and rejection of human imagination made him an opponent to all things aesthetic. I say something good about everybody but Descartes. Uh, I want to end today with some reflections on Immanuel Kant, who although deeply influenced by Descartes, managed to break away from him in important ways. Kant, of course, was not an atheist. He did believe in God, but he also systematically destroyed all of the traditional proofs for God's existence. What we uh, were left with after Kant was basically agnosticism. It would be best, according to him, that we act as if we believed in God, even though we have no proofs for his existence. So Kant was deeply ambiguous about religion. We cannot prove that God exists, but morality would be meaningless without God, and free will would be impossible without the existence of a transcendent soul, or so it seemed. Because of his residual Cartesian dualism, Kant would not conceive, could not conceive of free will as just another word for the amazing creativity open to us as material beings. Kant wrote three great critiques. The critique of pure reason, which showed that metaphysics has limits, in particular that it cannot prove that God exists, although it can provide us with certain a priori truths, such as that everything has a cause. The critique of practical reason, which attempted to ground morality in the categorical imperative, as I said previously, uh, you should always treat people as ends and not as means. Um, and the critique of judgment, which deals with issues of taste, beauty, the sublime, fine art, and the apparent design of the universe. By the time he got to this last book, he had a problem. He knew he could not prove the existence of a transcendent realm, a realm of God, heaven, and the soul. And yet he thought he needed this realm to make sense of ethical theory. The critique of judgment, besides allowing him a chance to apply his previously developed ideas to art, aesthetics, and nature, provided he, uh, he thought, a solution to the problem of the gap opened up in his philosophy between the world of experience and the transcendent realm. In my view, and I think in his as well, this book was the culmination of his entire career. And the most important part of the critique of judgment comes when Kant discusses what he calls the fine artist, which he also called the genius. It is in this discussion that Kant describes what he calls aesthetic ideas. 
And here's my handout. So I figured that you wouldn't be able to handle this if you didn't have a piece of paper in front of you because it's a quote from Kant, right? So, so here's a quote from Kant on aesthetic ideas, which appears in paragraph 49, titled, The Faculties of the Mind Which Constitute Genius. Soul, um, in an aesthetic sense, signifies the animating principle of the mind. For example, when a poem is more than merely pretty or elegant, it has soul. Uh, oddly, this is also used in talking about the blues or jazz. Um, but that whereby this principle animates the psychic substances, meaning basically the mind, the material which it employs for that purpose is that which sets the mental powers, that is the imagination and the understanding, into swing, which means that it sets them into what he calls a free play that gives us a special pleasure that we get from beauty. That free play is final, by which he means that it is a play which is self-maintaining and which strengthens the power of such activity. He goes on to say, now my proposition is that this principle is nothing else than the faculty of presenting aesthetic ideas. But by an aesthetic idea, I mean that representation of the imagination, which just refers to a picture or an image in your mind, which induces much thought, yet without the possibility of any definite thought, whatever. In other words, you can't define this thought uh, in terms of logic, it's not the kind of thought that he would have called a concept. There's no concept adequate to this thought. And also language, consequently, can never get quite on level terms with or render completely intelligible. You can't really fully explain this experience that I was earlier referring to as uh, inspiration or insight. And he goes on to say, a rational idea, by contrast, and he has a special meaning for the word rational idea, and he's, I'm going to explain that now, is a concept to which no intuition can be adequate. Uh, examples of rational ideas would be God and soul and afterlife. Um, and for him, you can't ever fully intuit what those things are. You can't even experience what God is. Further, quote, the imagination as a productive faculty of cognition is a powerful agent for creating, as it were, a second nature out of the material supplied to it by actual nature. It affords us entertainment where experience proves too commonplace and we even use it to remodel experience. And he's talking about what art can accomplish. And by this means, we get a sense of our freedom so that we can borrow materials from nature, working them up into something that, as he puts it, surpasses nature. Quote, such representations of the imagination, that is, what he referred to as aesthetic ideas, may be termed ideas. He calls them ideas because they are um, somewhat like the ideas of reason. This is partly because they are at least strain after something lying out beyond the confines of experience and so seek to approximate to a presentation of rational concepts. Again, these are ideas like God or abstract ideas like the idea of death or platonic forms. Thus giving to these concepts a semblance of an objective reality. Notice he says semblance. He is not really committed here to God's existence. Uh, further, the poet, meaning any artistic genius, tries to interpret to sense the rational ideas of invisible beings, this transcendent realm, and other religious ideas as well as abstract ideas related to life. Now I must admit that I am uh, going to give a somewhat unorthodox take on what Kant means by aesthetic ideas. Kant might not have approved of how I woke 
go about using this notion. My take on aesthetic ideas is that they are essentially powerful metaphors. They are not literal truths but rather ways of seeing things. They are the central focus or force behind all sorts of creativity. As Kant correctly said, they cause our thoughts to seemingly go on unendingly or as he also said, they generate much thought but no final definition. They are sublime insofar as we find them astonishing and a little scary. The art of genius is the art of creating aesthetic ideas. Great works of art just are aesthetic ideas materialized in a medium. Moreover, when a great work of art is created, including the great mythological stories of the great religions, what we get is a created world. The genius artist and the religious figure both create a world, a second nature as Kant described it, out of the materials of the world we actually encounter. As I have suggested, I have modified Kant's concept of aesthetic ideas somewhat. I have given them something of the character of what he called rational ideas or ideas of reason. By ideas of reason, Kant means something like what Plato meant by his eternal forms. Kant included as rational ideas the ideas of God, immortality, and the soul. But also the great ideas of philosophical interests, such as the ideas of justice and truth and beauty and all the what is questions I was talking about at the beginning of my talk. I'm willing to agree with Kant up to a point on this. The rational ideas are ideals, like the perfect circle. The perfect circle we've never actually seen. You can never actually draw a perfect circle because how could you ever get all the points equidistant from the center? But on my view, unlike Plato and perhaps Kant, ideal things are not real. Or rather, their only reality is their name and their touted ideal nature. Rational ideas, as he calls them, do not refer to real things. They are just abstract markers, endpoints in a never-ending quest. The aesthetic ideas, however, are real. They are real things directed towards or trying to represent something which is unreal except for a name, or perhaps a name in a minimal definition like we get for God. I fuse Kant's concept of aesthetic and rational ideas, dropping the aspects of each that I don't like. That is, aesthetic ideas, on my view, have a quality of unity that Kant never intended them to have, a unity he would not, however, have hesitated to attribute to rational ideas. I agree, however, with Kant on many points concerning aesthetic ideas that they will not be fully explicable, that they are not unchanging, that they are directed towards the rational ideas. But the important thing is that they do not belong to another realm. They belong to our world. They are an aspect of the world we experience. So in my view, what Kant called rational ideas just are aesthetic ideas, or better, are the unreal things aesthetic ideas unendingly aim towards. There are no rational ideas above and beyond aesthetic ideas. And one way of putting this is that if you want to see a rational idea or a referent of a rational idea, you can only look at an aesthetic idea. If you want to see God, you can only look at representations of God in churches and so forth. That is, rational ideas are just words. They have no content, but they function as abstract goals, as things aesthetic ideas try to express, even when those things are not real and have no real reference. Kant may be right that it might be best to act as if rational ideas were real, but the real things are the aesthetic ideas. Um, and I believe I'll stop there. Thank you. If you have questions, uh, raise your hand and I'll pass the mic around. Thank you again. A lovely talk. Uh, good to get a true philosopher here. Mm -hmm. So one of the <clears throat> fairs of both science and philosophy is should. What should I do? Um, philosophy attempts it in some ways. Science cannot derive how you should act. Right. Yeah. Um, do you see that changing forward? 
uh, it's any progress being made? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that science will ever, I mean, that's one of the reasons why philosophers will stay in business for a long time to come. And uh, that uh, normative issues, uh, not only what we should do, but what is valuable. Uh, scientists can tell us what would be valuable if you want this sort of conditional value and that and that's an important stepping point so that you can say that if you want to uh, achieve uh, greater intelligence perhaps we could help us along in that respect through genetic engineering that would be uh, a, a conditional but it wouldn't tell us whether or not we ought to try to achieve greater intelligence that's something we're going to have to just discuss in philosophical d debates about what it is to be a human. So these what is questions like what is a human, um, there are scientific answers that cover part of the answer to that question but there are more sort of existential questions that we just have to deal with and that's one of the reasons why I think that philosophers always have to keep an eye on what the religious thinkers, the great religious thinkers were trying to solve, what they were trying to deal with, I think not adequately but... They, they got plenty of shit. <laughs> yes, they have lots of shoulds, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I noticed you used the term God in the singular. Oh yeah, right. Um, but as you know, there are many omnipotent gods discussed mm -hmm. in the modern world. Uh, and it, when you go back further, uh, our ancestors invented one God for every mystery of the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there were dozens. Um, now, uh, one interesting fact that I recently uncovered, and I'm writing an article about it, uh, is that all humans were atheists until less than 80,000 years ago. Mm. The proof of that is that humans could not talk in depth about gods until after they learned to talk in depth. And that was less than 80,000 years ago, a very recent event in evolutionary terms. Before that, there was no chance. Uh, and uh, so, and, and a bunch of other things happened at the same time mm -hmm. that they learned to talk in depth, uh, which is, uh, I think, an interesting development. That's an excellent uh, comment and thought. Uh, I think that when I refer to uh, God, an interesting thing about the singular God uh, is that um, throughout the three great Western religions, uh, Christianity, uh, Mohammedanism, and um, Judaism, there is generally accepted the idea that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. And um, one of the odd things about that is that the definition is such that it's pretty easy for somebody to be an atheist because you can pretty easily show that that's just not a possible being. Um, so that is um, uh, probably it would be a good idea to go back to something earlier as you were <laughs> discussing. Uh, one possibility is, as you mentioned, that people use the word various other multiple gods um, to refer to many different kinds of conceptual structures. And I think that actually, if you look at ancient Greek philosophy, there's a great continuity between er early mythology and philosophy. And so far, each one of those early <laughs> mythological figures, like the goddess of love, could be understood as basically just exemplifying the concept of love. So when you get to the philosophers, like Plato, for example, when he discussed the question, what is love, um, or rather beauty, um, that he uh, talked about the goddess of beauty and then he just starts talking about beauty itself, the concept of beauty. So the, the individual, when you're talking about multiple gods, you're really talking about proto-philosophical concepts. I don't really know whether, how early religion goes. It's really so hard to figure that one out because uh, you look at some 
burials that go back quite a long ways in the human species um, and it seems like people must have some sort of religious belief in order to have a desire to bury their their dead but I'm not sure about that who would know uh, yeah okay Alfred do you want to call on somebody or yeah Ed. Um, I enjoyed the talk very much. I wanted to say a couple things. I'm sort of overwhelmed how technical it is yeah, right. uh, that you're doing. And uh, but I, a couple things that are basic to my belief system is one. I was just trying to find it in the novel I was reading or not, uh, the uh, piece of literature I'm reading. Uh, well, let's say called the Politics of Experience, but it's about the. Uh, a part of it is about mentions the uh, 300 or 30 or 3 million. I got my numbers mixed up, but the millions of people wiped out on the planet in wars in the last 100 years, uh -huh, yeah. and uh, that and. Um, the the other thing I wanted to point out because this is the overwhelming thing about how I think and how humans care about each other or don't. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm here today, but. Uh, I would like to know, as a former journalist who was having a hard time uh, devouring all your things, how would you headline your talk and your subtitle for your talk? <laughs> um, so you are starting off by talking about um, war and death, and of course a lot of that comes from belief systems and competing <laughs> belief systems, and, uh, and I didn't really, in my talk, sort of focus on all the things that are really negative about belief systems and, and religion. It's quite possible, unfortunately, that organized atheism has caused almost as much mayhem in the last few hundred years. Uh, but especially, for example, in the Soviet Union and uh, in China. But in, in any case, um, it's, it's a real that's a real evil. Uh, one can't set that aside. I mean, I'm not going to be an apologist for religion uh, on those points. What I'm more interested in is, is the ways in which religious experience um, seems to me to, to mask um, and then with beliefs that really aren't necessary to mask something that's much more fundamental that you can find in philosophy and in great art. And um, I think that pretty much sums up what I'm trying to say in this talk today. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, a, a very good talk, you know, and, and, um, uh, and uh, I agree with you that there's nothing at all that's, uh, um, uh, that, that's attractive about atheism itself, you know, but atheism is is is, is centered on the is, issue of God, and I'm sort of somebody who is you know scientific and and um, for focusing on reality instead of God, mm -hmm. you know, because God really isn't part of reality and therefore isn't interesting enough to talk about. <laughs> but um, but but I, I, the people tend to um, separate philosophy from science as if those were two different things and I'd like to see, make a sort of a connection between the two is that uh, science is the, under, is the pursuit of the understanding of reality as it really is and truth is you know correct information that we um, understand about reality through science and so um, you know, but, but when you get into philosophy, you're talking about values and what's better. Well, in order to do science, you have to start with the presumption that the right answer is better than the wrong answer. And in fact, that is the very definition of better and value, is, is, is getting the right answer. And the, the other uh, fundamental axiom is that to exist is better than not to exist. Mm -hmm. So in order to maintain our existence, we have to learn how to live in harmony with reality. And, and if you take those two concepts, that the right answer is better than the wrong answer, and that to exist is better than not to exist, you can create a, a moral structure that's a, basically a scientific philosophy. I'm just wondering if you, what do you think of that idea? Well, yeah, thanks uh, for that comment, and it's, uh, it's a viable project. I'm not convinced yet um, that you can generate um, a moral theory out of uh, scientific analysis of the world. Um, it's just not clear to me how that's going to happen. There's a 
problem that goes all the way back to the time of Hume called the is-ought problem, which is how do you get from what is the case to what ought to be the case. And it just seems like there aren't any real inferential connections between the two. But it seems to me that um, that philosophers are pretty open-minded about at least discussing uh, any of these issues. And what you were just describing to me, although you described it as a scientific way of looking at me, uh, things, <laughs> is actually from my perspective just another philosophy. Uh, you, you're trying to develop a theory about the nature of morality and your jumping off point are certain scientific facts and um, methodologies. Um, and that's, I'm happy with that. I'm not sure whether it's true, but I think it's a good project. Did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next question. How do, uh, what's our philosopher's attitude toward neuroscience as it pertains to what it means to be human? Yeah, these days, um, most of the philosophers I know are very excited about neuroscience. Um, and uh, there are different philosophical communities, and it may be that there are philosophers that are much more closely associated with certain religious groups that I, don't, I just don't know personally. I mean, most, of the, most American philosophers that I know who belong to the American Philosophical Association or the American Society for Aesthetics, they, they are very excited about neuroscience. And um, I, half the papers I go to make references these days to neuroscience. So philosophers have been doing a lot of reading in neuroscience. So um, yeah, um, whether or not neuroscience can tell us everything we need to know about what it is to be human, I don't think so. I think that one of the reasons for that is simply because uh, we aren't just our brains, actually. We are a function of the interaction between um, our bodies and the surrounding environment. On my view, uh, the brains are only one part of that. Um, so yeah, our brains are absolutely fundamental to who we are and, and when your brain's dead, you're dead. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that simply because it's a necessary condition to be human, that it's really the whole thing. Uh, so I think there are some philosophers these days who uh, go along with that idea. Um, I know that there's some philosophers in Berkeley who have been uh, promoting the notion that uh, neuroscience doesn't give you the full explanation of what it is to be human. Uh, Alvin Noe is probably the most important uh, philosopher who's working in this area these days. Hi, Arthur Jackson here. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me, uh, from, from, my, from my own thinking, getting to the core of things is, is critical. And to, it seems to me that what, what that gets to in my best thinking is that first we don't have a, a, a generally a completely accepted definition of science at this time. I think our definitions of religion are way off base. Mm. I personally define science as the search for congruency for everything to fit together and that's what we're trying to do. I, I define religion as a search for meaning why do we get up in the morning and go to bed at night with the idea of getting up the next morning? We have to have a reason, and to my mind, that gets in the area of, of meaning. And I think very definitely that can be studied from a scientific perspective once we get focused to do something like that rather than to build better bombs, and et cetera. Mm. I think that the idea of congruency is, is an important one, although interestingly it would probably be shared by religious thinkers as well and also by people who are uh, very strongly committed to art because uh, when you think about how art actually tries to make things that fit beautifully uh, and that's true not simply in the fine arts but also in the the popular arts and in everyday um, art forms like getting a good haircut <laughs> doesn't fit. Uh, so yeah, congruency is something that is fundamental to what it is to be a human. Uh, so I like the idea of congruency. As far as meaning goes, gosh, that's such a big issue. Uh, and it's something that uh, we 
uh, philosophers are constantly interested in, not only in terms of trying to figure out what language means, but also in terms of trying to figure out um, what certain concepts mean. And um, of course, when I said we have to figure out what the word God means <laughs> before we can say that God doesn't exist, and so that's an issue of meaning as well. Uh, I can't really address the issue of meaning it now because it's such a big issue today. Hi, can you describe in the context of selfish gene and procreation being fundamental uh -huh. of life? Uh, from that context, uh, the death is, uh, we cannot accept death. So the emergence of religion uh -huh. for the fear of death, uh -huh. instead of talking about immaterial or soul, which I don't understand being a scientist, uh -huh. can you describe from that context how religion came about? And because as human, Mm -hmm. uh, we are very selfish. Our genes are very selfish, if you read Richard mm -hmm. Dawkins, mm -hmm. but also other biologists, mm -hmm. as well as procreation, the fundamental definition of life. Mm -hmm. So based on that, death is counterintuitive or not accepted in, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. So we procreate. So from that perspective, we are very afraid of death. So can you describe from that perspective how religion came about. Thank you. Well, I think it actually you probably already have described how religion came about. I mean, I think it was actually originally an attempt to deal with the, the fear of death. And philosophers have had uh, some pretty good responses to that going all the way back to ancient times. So one response to that was the idea that, um, uh, as the uh, Epicureans put it, uh, death is, is nothing to us. And what they meant by that was that um, uh, death, uh, when you die, you, you cease to exist, and, and therefore, why worry about it? Because you're not are going to be around <laughs> to, to suffer from being dead. Uh, so, uh, uh, when they said death is nothing to us, it had a kind of double meaning. It meant not only that when we die we become nothing, but also that it's nothing to worry about. Um, so philosophers, even in, in ancient times, began to question the idea that that um, we need such a radical solution uh, to the problem of, of death. Now, somebody like Friedrich Nietzsche, I think, has a, a much better even answer to the question of death because he uh, is responding to their religious conviction that um, to make meaning out of life, to get back to your issue of meaning, is to um, have some sort of deity for, for Nietzsche. Um, it's an important thing for us to be able to say yes to the life that we're actually going to live, to affirm life uh, with the recognition that when he said that God is dead, what he really meant in a way is that you know, we're, not, we're not going to go into an afterlife, but there is still a possibility of transcendent experience or experience in which you go beyond what is um, uh, ordinarily normal human meaning to something that's more fundamental or exciting about um, the creation of meaning in human existence. That is something that I believe is, you know, um, science has just not really address that issue uh, and I think that one of the ways that it can be addressed is through philosophical inquiry and that's one of the reasons why I'm pretty excited about Nietzsche as a philosopher. But he is uh, somebody who shares with science a rejection of uh, the existence of God and even the existence of an afterlife. So, so there's a pretty radical transformation if you go from a period in which you believe that when you die you're going to go to heaven and meet your relatives to, to a period in which you believe that okay when you die that's a moment in which you just cease to exist, so you might as well say yes to this life. Um, I'm not sure whether I fully answered your question. You look skeptical. <laughs> Which is all right because I've been praising skepticism from the beginning of this lecture. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. My question is not about death. My question is about birth. Okay. When one is born, uh, one can ask the question, why was I born? in this body of these parents and not in the one next door. <laughs> and, uh, this is, perhaps the one next door 
is a very wealthy family, uh, very healthy, and so on, and yeah. you're born in just the opposite family. Now, there must be something, because this question actually came to me in a very unusual circumstance. I mentioned this here before, because I asked the same question. On account of uh, the company I retired from, which was here in Silicon Valley, I was supporting uh, a company from here in Latin America, and I was once in Argentina, and in Buenos Aires, and uh, during the summer, uh, this, uh, I had free time, I decided to go to see Iguazu Falls, which are very famous. Then on the way back, it was raining cats and dogs in Buenos Aires, and in the local airport, Jorge Newberry Airport, uh, there was a line waiting for taxis. And then some of the taxis were really nice taxis. The price was dictated by the government, so it was the same. Were really nice taxis, wonderful drivers, etc. And others were crunchy drivers, and uh, the car was falling apart. But you had no choice. There was a line. So it came to me. You know, maybe a birth is the same thing. But I was wondering if <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> if you have any idea, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that question, although it's a wonderful story. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's just like death. You have no choice. <laughs> you, you're born to who you are. You, you die at a certain point. And again, uh, you know, as Nietzsche would say, you just have to be Come who you are and uh, be able to affirm your own life with the recognition that there is no deity who's deciding which family you're going to be born into. It's just a matter of luck, bad or good. Um, Play the cards that you've been delivered. Well, getting to our, back to that question of death, can you say something about Heidegger's being towards death? Do you know anything about yeah, that? Yeah, of course. Um, so, what you're what you're interested in is is as a motivation for religion or as uh, simply a condition of human existence. Um, and of course, one of the things that uh, let's look at it in that way as a condition of human existence. Um, and, and and this gets back actually to the question about why people would want to believe in religion. And it may be because we are constantly recognizing the fact that we're going to die. Um, so I think that, um, again, one of the really great ways to respond to that fact that we're always conscious of the fact that we're going to die and, and even that we're getting older and that life is constantly changing for that, for us in that respect, is to, uh, as Nietzsche puts it, uh, amor fati, love fate, love your fate, be willing to say yes to your own life. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, for me, that's probably something that's fundamental to a, a humanist uh, faith, if we want to use that word, faith, in connection with humanism. I think Heidegger's idea was if being towards death is if you can own your, the possibility of your death in the future, you're leading a more authentic life. It's yeah, that sounds uh, like a great idea to me. I mean, and it sounds actually pretty similar to what Nietzsche was saying as well. Yeah. And right. Any other questions? Uh, you say that religious experience is uh, an experience of the sublime, mm. and I'm wondering if yeah. the atheist can have a similar experience yes. that might be considered an experience of the sublime, yeah. and what would you mean by that? Yeah, and so th actually that's probably almost the main point of my talk, uh, and so that the atheist can have experiences of the sublime, but of course uh, when you're talking about the sublime, all you really require for an experience of the sublime is um, something that is very sort of magnificent or powerful. It could be a something sublime in nature uh, or something sublime in a great work of art. Uh, but also it has to have this element in the traditional definition of the sublime that has to have this element of terror or scariness. So experiencing, for example, a great Greek tragedy, that can be a sublime experience. Uh, it can also remind you of the fact that you are being towards death, that you're going to, you, that these characters are going through a, a, an incredibly powerful and, and actually, in our sense, the word tragic experience. But at the same time, it's a uh, sublime experience for us as uh, enjoyers of that uh, performance where we can cathartically engage with the tragic performance in the, the lives of these characters. 
that can be a very moving and deep experience that gives meaning to, to human existence. So this is one of the reasons why people go uh, on great hikes in nature. This is why people go to art museums or the great concerts uh, of uh, performers in order to have experiences that are sublime. Um, Sublime is yeah, something sure. extraordinary out of your... That's right, with a, with a certain element of terror or scariness to it, yeah. How about ha happiness, joy? Is that, can that be sublime? Uh, happiness and joy are more closely associated with the concept of, of beauty, which is a, also an important aesthetic concept. Um, and, um, uh, but joy, joy is a funny one because religious thinkers often have associated joy with the experience of God, which is a sublime experience for them. So if you are an atheist and you believe that you've had a sublime experience, that might be one that would be joyful. So happiness is a different kind of concept. Now, this, this is regarding, you know, Aisha. This is regarding why things happen to us. Uh, it's like, oh, okay. Now is it okay? Okay, so do you believe in karma or what's your thought on karma? Oh yes, I personally don't believe in, in okay. karma. If karma refers to um, uh, dying and being reborn again. Um, however, if karma refers to uh, something like fate uh, or if it's referring to uh, the circumstances into which you are thrown, as, as Alfred Jan was referring to the idea of being towards death and what sort of attitude one should take to that, then of course that idea makes sense to me. So this is somewhat like what I was talking about previously. There's sort of the mythological version of a religious belief that, um, if, for example, in Christianity, it said that when we die that we will go to heaven and meet our, our relatives or God or something of that sort. Um, and um, I think that that's surely false. Um, but, um, and there are certain versions of the belief in karma that are similar, that when you die you might be reborn as a, another person or as a, but that, what, that requires the be, capacity to have this thing called a soul which is separable from the body. Um, and I just don't see personally any evidence for such a thing at all. Um, so um, that's a, an area in which I'm pretty die-hard atheist on that one, yeah. All right, that's enough time for Q&A. Let's join Tom at the uh, speaker's table and let's give Tom a big hand.